Welcome, Welcome to the webinar. Not really, because it's the just as the organizer and may now speak to any other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready to be like indented into the case, on the go to webinar control panel to allow all attendees to hear you. This system will notify so you once you are in the first time. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Is that okay? Okay. Do you remember the words? Okay. Um, okay. Oh, wait, just a second. Can you tell me what you had for breakfast? Food is here and ready. Okay. She's oh, they're just recording something. Okay, can you tell me what you had for breakfast now? Coffee. Coffee, all right. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, now you say before. How do we get into presenters? Oh, I see. Do we need Oh, I, I guess they didn't ask for it, so I think. Okay. Yes. Um, oh, I apologize. Should be working. Yes. Where all the stuff is. Some of them might stand here. Some might move around. <laughs> Cannot make any promises. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, do you have any more batteries, David? I do not, no. Actually, those were not mine. Those belong to the cops. Oh, this is perfect. Okay, this is perfect. And then sometimes you have to, like, click once to make this active again. Okay. Jack, you got it? Yes. It's working now. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's really make sure that that works. Yes, good. Just look into that camera. All right. We're going to get started. Just a second. Started. Just a reminder that we will have one last final opportunity for the uh, silent auction to outbid your neighbors right at the end of the snap talk. We'll have a, a free for all where you can just have at it. Extra points if you take out the table in the process. <laughs> Can you get the buttons? <laughs> <laughs> can you just pick up a pair of them? Okay, they will probably stay over here. I have a pair and I have a bunch of them. Sure. I have the rest of the sum of 13, but they actually just 12. More than 13. Okay, just a reminder to our Snap Talkers. Uh, these are Snap Talks. Uh, they are eight minute long talks. We will have timekeepers down here who will give you a sign when you have three minutes left and a sign when you have one minute left. And we will uh, cut you off at eight minutes, but of course none of you are going to go past eight minutes because we had an excellent communications workshop yesterday, so you're all expert communicators. <laughs> and you're going to be really good at it. Uh, so, but we will cut you off at that eight minutes just so we make sure we have time to include everyone. Uh, but if you do get cut off, Please do not fear. Uh, that's just encouragement to come and speak to people about what, whatever was in the rest of your talk throughout the rest of the workshop. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Sylvia Thompson, and then we'll welcome her up to the stage. Um, and I'm going to... Are you going to stand back here, Sylvia? Uh, probably. Okay. Uh, can I? Yes. Okay. Am I not talking to you? Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, video producer. 
What? Sorry? I am a beautiful professor. Oh, so we're the same. Yes, yeah, so we are the same. Almost the same. I'm from the zero. So, All right, can I? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Silvia Dota. I'm from Brazil. Uh, in this map, you can see where my city is. I live around Sao Paulo, five kilometers. It's an industrial region. And today I will talk about a project that I uh, started last year. It's called PolarCast, Production in Science of Scientific Videos, co-authored between teachers and students. Uh, I've been working uh, with educational technology for 25 years. And the last six years, I decided to start an uh, Antarctica project in my university, applying all my knowledge about educational technology uh, to uh, popularize science. So we are an interdisciplinary group, research group. I am a researcher in education and communication. And we develop video games, uh, apps to um, many kinds of, uh, of equipments, distance learning course, uh, video classes, scientific videos, and learning objects, and so on. Uh, well, the project that I will talk about is, um, has the goals to introduce in a classroom, process for the pro production of scientific videos. The important thing of this is that the students should learn the process, the science process, and make videos showing the science process. The idea is to uh, to look at the the science in a way that only the researchers. Uh, uh, understand. So we try to create a bridge between researchers and the students. Uh, this project will uh, take place in in the university in my uh, scientific uh, education subject. It's a discipline uh, that I, I offer to students who will become teachers. And the Federal University of ABC, it's a new university in Brazil. We are uh, working for 10 years now, and we are interdis interdisciplinary. So I am uh, graduated in communication, and then I give classes to mathematics students, uh, teacher, teaching stu students. So it's very difficult to work in this university. It's very challenging. And we have to create new projects all, all the time. So this project is one of them. Uh, what the students is studying this, in this project were techniques of audiovisual production in order to uh, multiply this technique in their classroom. So the idea is that the students learn how to produce videos and go to their uh, classroom and teach their students how to do that. Uh, so the, one of the problems that I, I faced at the beginning of the project was with the workshops about the video production because the students want to, to learn how to be a teacher of mathematics, of biology, but now how to produce videos. So this was a challenge that I have to face and I have to in, engage them to this, this activity and to break their uh, prejudice about this. So we did many uh, guided studies, many texts about science popularization, uh, scientific culture, and the, the use of videos in, in classroom and so on. The idea that we worked in at, at the classroom was that uh, uh, well, it was another challenge because 
when you you think about a video in the school, you always think that the teacher will be in front of the the board and talking and uh, 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 transmitting something. And the idea was to uh, break this and use all knowledge that we have in video production to bring this to the to the school. So the the students produced in, were divided in nine groups and they produced nine different videos. And to do this, uh, I put them in contact with researchers. So they uh, choose the subject. And then I found as a researcher in that subject and put them in contact and they worked together. Uh, they could uh, increase their communicative competence. They could multiply knowledge uh, about the subject of Antarctica. And they become able to produce, to reproduce the experience. I'd like to show uh, not uh, the, the, the complete video, but only uh, a little bit. Ele é um animal que vive em algumas partes frias do planeta e possui características peculiares que nos levam a algumas perguntas. Para isso. So, uh, as you can see, they all different languages, and it was the language it was also chosen by them. <laughs> and você sabia que existem mais de 100 trabalhos de pesquisa na Antártica? Nessas bases são feitas inúmeras pesquisas que buscam explorar um pouco desse mundo desconhecido. Tem? So for for Brazilian, Antarctica is very very mysterious because it's too far and we don't ha you don't have any idea how the ice uh, looks so it's very oh sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> oh god <laughs> sorry <laughs> well so uh future work but it's already working is we have two projects. This one that the pictures you are seeing is this project being uh, taking place in a school of uh, the nine degree and uh, 12 years old, the children. This guy is my uh, video producer. He, he has a scholarship to work with me. And we have another project that we will start next month to teach teachers in our region about uh, how to introduce this. And of course, the subject is Antarctica. Thank you. No questions. Thank you very much, Great. That was right on eight minutes. Let's give another round of applause. Uh, Marcus, I believe you are next. Talk amongst yourselves in the meantime. The, the microphones. I told you. Videos this way. You would like to use some? Sure. Or, yes, if I you want to move, move around. This is for the recording, so she'll put that on. It's going to be really quick. Because I'm panicking. Nope. Okay. Can I? Excuse me. All right, here we go. If you want to, okay. <laughs> I love gl glacial landscapes, and it is so sad that they disappear. Similar things happen in polar and al alpine regions. The polar science became a topic in our new curriculum. I collaborated with Matthias Hoops for this presentation, and I'm organizing STEM days at school now. Glaciers visualize climate change. They provide water, 
for irrigation, electricity generation, and in Switzerland also for artificial snowmaking. Here I tell you some stories of Swiss glaciers, how they are connected to me. At first, the Pizzol Glacier, it is one in my region, and I went with a teacher's workshop to this glacier, and we went on to the glacier, and we did PEI experiments in the workshop, and even installed frost tubes to measure permafrost. But <coughs> this postcard is historic because the glacier collapsed last year. And so I went to the other glacier in my region. This is the Sardona Glacier with the next workshop. And <coughs> the glacier is, was connected, as you can see here, with another one, with the Senyas Glacier. But today, the, the two glaciers are separated. The Rhone Glacier is perhaps more famous. This is an old picture, a childhood memory for me. The glacier was visible from the Rhone Valley, as you can see, and now where a lake is forming and it is growing. And okay, yes, here on the left, you see a desperate try to save some ice. And this is how it might look in 30 years, perhaps. I went onto this glacier with my students and this was an unforgettable event for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> the Oberaar Glacier, I visit always, almost every year, was partly drowned when they built a, a dam wall. And 2007, the Tong almost reached the, the lake, but now you can see how it retreated. And the Perth Glacier is also a childhood memory of me. It was flowing into the Motorach Glacier, but today it doesn't even reach the other glacier. The Forno Glacier I visited last autumn. It looked like this, and look at the blue circle. 100 years ago, you could almost walk from the cabin to the glacier. And the Aletsch is the most famous of the Alps. You can see how it retreated in, the la in 70 years. And new threats are arising in the Alps, like rock slides and landslides. This was two years ago. And the, oops, the following animation shows you the advance and retreat of the alpine glaciers in the last ice age. On the left is Lake Geneva. And we are 100,000 years before today. But now I try to skip some years because it <laughs> takes too much time. Where are we? Oh. Can't find the, okay. Oh, here, here we are. And I, I go to the last maximum. And you see there is no sea near Venedig. The water is just coming later. We are 15,000 years before today. The glaciers. And this is, everything you see is a, was a natural process. But now humankind interferes with the climate system. Go to glamas.ch and have a look at the glacier monitoring of Switzerland. You will find a lot of information and 
behind all this information is a lot of field work. For example, reading the level posts, poles, or measuring snow density, or <coughs> the flow rate with GPS, or installing new level poles with mechanical or with steam drills. And by the way, we have the worldwide longest measuring series of glaciers more than this year, it will be 105 years of measurement. How have our glaciers changed? There was always melting in the last time, but the, <clears throat> if you look at the last years, you can see that six of the nine most extreme melting seasons were after 2011. And the changes in total glacier volume was 20% from 1920 to 1980, but it was 37% from 1980 to 2018. So what is the future of our glaciers? This experiment shows what happens if the climate would remain on the level from 1990 to 2010. So the small glaciers disappear and the the alleged would remain partly. And the experiment two shows if warming continues, then even the big glacier will disappear, the biggest one. And if everything goes on as until now, we will lose probably 95% of the glaciers until 2100, and if we try to reduce CO2 emissions, the loss will still be 80%. So, the retreat is increasing more and more. And in Switzerland, the rise could be four degrees and probably 90% of the glaciers will disappear. Only an immediate and massive reduction of CO2 can save some glaciers. We can't stop it, I think, <laughs> with um, observing and documenting. We save our glaciers as long as they are here. <laughs> we'll take that microphone back from you. Okay. <laughs> I want to. I don't know if he wants me to tell you this, but he had something like 60 slides in there and eight minute presentation. Beautiful. Well done. <laughs> well done. And he fit in the, our motto for the workshop, the Connect, Create, or Connect Communicate, Collaborate, Create. Good job. The extra files. I should get the next thing ready. Yeah. Do you want to stand or move? Oh, there you go. No, I no? maybe I stay here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so can you hear me? You might have to move a little closer to this thing. Oh. So can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm Rainer Lehmann, uh, Polar Educators Germany, and I want to present uh, a, a few slides about the uh, Mosaic project. Mosaic is a very uh, big name, and uh, probably uh, some of you know what stands behind it is a multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of Arctic climate. So why such a project? It's not working. No. Okay, that should work. So, okay, it's working now. So the reason, uh, you know already this map, um, it shows uh, the epicenter of the global warming in the Arctic, and uh, it's very dramatic. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, future uh, models uh, show very big uncertainty, uh, uncertainties of the climate pro projections. Um, you see here um, the, oops, moment, Sophia. No. Okay. You see here uh, the equator and uh, South Pole and North Pole. 
and the uncertainty uncertain uncertainty is biggest in uh, the Arctic. So why is that? Because uh, that's uh, we don't have uh, stations in the Arctic Ocean um, for the reason that we have uh, sea ice, of course. And uh, the idea was to have at least one year a station drifting through the Arctic and taking uh, data as much as possible. And uh, you know probably this uh, guy is also very famous. The idea was from him, but uh, since then nobody else uh, tried to do uh, the same thing. Um, now you see the route of the polar stern. Uh, we'll start in Tromsø and then uh, we'll break into the ice to reduce the time in the ice uh, for one year or to one year. Um, this uh, ship will be the cent central observatory, but uh, there are probably lots of uh, networks, camps on the ice in addition. And uh, of course, uh, we need uh, what you, send, you can see here is uh, uh, well, the root of the drift, which is uh, uh, which, which it should be, and uh, after one year, the ship should be here in the farm straight between Greenland and uh, Spitsbergen. Um, the supply and support is, uh, by, is by other ships and also by um, airplanes during the time when uh, the ice is too thick that the ships cannot reach Polarstern. So uh, the scientific focus areas, I want to show you it's very quickly. Uh, we have uh, the focus on sea ice, of course, uh, the boundary layer, the atmosphere above the sea ice, then uh, the fluxes of uh, energy, for example, between atmosphere, ice, and ocean. Um, then the higher atmosphere with clouds, aerosols, radiation, and at least ecosystems, and uh, there the um, transports between marine ecosystems, ice, and atmosphere also. Um, and that is uh, called also the biogeochemical fluxes. And all these data will be coupled and uh, put together so that we have the multidisciplinary uh, approach. Okay, um, this is interesting uh, uh, timeline because here, for example, you see day and night and then uh, at about uh, mid-October, uh, night starts, and here we have also all the uh, no, no light at all. And then day and light from March, April, and then total daylight uh, from the middle of April. This are the support ships and airplane, and uh, on Fedorov here, there is a possibility for four educators to join the company, and uh, they will stay there for about six weeks on the ship and uh, working with the uh, Apex school. Um, that is one point interesting for us. And uh, we are now starting, or we are at the beginning of the uh, educational program. And uh, there are some people from the Abi in Potsdam. Um, and here you see uh, the team and the team leaders. Uh, and here is my contact to these persons. Uh, with Markus, I have uh, personal contact. and. With Marcel or better Renata, I have a telephone call. Um, they want to cooperate with us and we get data and uh, photos and maybe telephone call and also with uh, Benjamin and uh, in the for, for oceans. Uh, with Ellen Dum, I will have a phone call at the end of this month. And uh, with Alison, I have to get in touch. I haven't got her until now. But um, data will be published on the website, uh, available, and we are asked to do something with it. And uh, so we can start pre-ice, of course, um, to introduce the students what is going on. It's a very fascinating thing. Students are very, yeah, like this. Um, and then during the, uh, the drift on ice, uh, we can get data and we can make, for example, some telephone calls and something like that and post ice we could um, develop uh, educational, educational material with the data we got then. So if you have any ideas, any wishes, just contact me and uh, we try to do something out of this uh, big project. So thank you.
Rainer says eight minutes. I don't even need eight minutes. Oh, yeah, six minutes. Fair. <laughs> Good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, initially, I am grateful to PEI organizers for giving me opportunity to present some of my work here. I have been involved in Antarctic studies since 2002, and I have been to Antarctica twice. Uh, and later on, my students they have participated in Antarctic expeditions. And last year, I have been to uh, Arctic, and where we are studying. Uh, <clears throat> ozone depletion and uh, ultraviolet radiations. So I am working on uh, impact of ultraviolet radiations on uh, Antarctic and Arctic plants. So we have studied similar plants uh, in Himalaya region also. So I am studying similar plants over there. So what is the impact of ultraviolet radiations uh, <clears throat> and how plants are able to cope with the high UV radiations under the extreme conditions. These are my projects. Uh, <clears throat> as you know that uh, ozone depletion is going on and uh, because we are uh, using chlorofluorocarbons, but now because of the Montreal protocols and Puerto protocols, there is a decrease in the emission of uh, CFCs, but still whatever the CFC they are in the atmosphere, they are causing great harm to the ozone, dip, uh, ozone layer. And you all know that ozone is very important for the survival. So increased, in, sorry, uh, increased in, uh, intensity of UV radiations could be detrimental for the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystem. This is the part of my studies. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we have taken th three different group of plants and that includes aquatic algae uh, and a moss, bryum, and a lichen. Lichens are the most common species growing in the polar regions. So we want to study what is the evolutionary development of pigments in three different group of plants, that how the, uh, how the pigments are developing in these plants and how plants are able, means polar plants are able to cope with the increasing UV radiations. So that will remove some of the uncertainties about the risk of ozone depletion and our better understanding of UV effects on terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, there are, as you know, there are only few species and uh, some of things I will left. Uh, we are having a Himadri research station at uh, uh, Nialisen. Uh, and we used to go there and we perform our experiments over there. And this is just to show you that we have developed uh, UV filter frames. And when we, uh, when we put these UV filter frames over the plants in the study area, uh, the UV radiations, they do not go inside the plants. And uh, the UV radiation being stopped by these UV screens. So these are our control sets and similarly we have many sets in the uh, study area and there are many plants which are being exposed to the UV radiations. Then what we are doing, we are comparing under the control sets and under the experimental sets how much UV pigments are being in induced. 
So this is just the uh, readings of ultraviolet radiations and ozone layer. Uh, this is a closer view of UV filter frames and the plants are inside this. Uh, there are some better pictures also. Uh, these are the frames which we are using for the aquatic algae on the uh, Priyadarshini Lake near my station at Antarctica, East Antarctica. And these are the, some of the observations about the <coughs> UV radiations at 305, 312, 320 nanometers. And then we have studied about the uh, UV absorbing pigments. And there is a comparison that we are having higher amount of uh, these UV absorbing pigments in one of the is a lichen, uh, this is Bernatocarpon and this is a moss that in the exposed plants there is more UV absorbing pigments as compared to, to the plants which we have stopped the, uh, stopped the UV radiations by putting filters over them. And we have studied about the chlorophylls and there is their interpretations also. Uh, we have studied about the phenolics also in these plants. Phenolics also produce, uh, they give also give protection against the harmful uh, radiations. And then carotenoids, carotenoids also uh, uh, provide protection. And we have uh, some measurements of uh, total uh, um, UV index and uh, The maximum is about 7.8 uh, in the last year, my studies. And these are the average UV index and maximum UV index. And what we find, the interesting thing is that when we have selected three group of plants, one is moss, one is aquatic algae, and this is a lichen, Janthuria elegans. So land plants have more of these pigments when they are getting the exposure of UV radiations as compared to the aquatic plants because water acts as a filter. So UV radiations, they do not go deep into the water. But the plants which are growing on the rocks or on the land, they are getting maximum uh, UV radiation and they are having more of these pigments which provide, pig, uh, which provide protection. So it is natural that when they are getting the more UV radiations, there will be more of UV pigments. And this induction of UV pigments is because of the DNA and DNA is activated by UV radiations. Uh, there are so many other things. These are the, some of the aquatic algae and these are the plants growing at Svalbard's. Uh, we have studied on these also, similar experiments, these are lichens, uh, I am talking about the Janthuri alien. Uh, these are the carotenoids which give you, which gives the so beautiful color and these carotenoids, they give protection to the plants. So one can use the pigments for making the natural creams also where you are having higher amount of uh, UV radiations. So one can use these lichens also and number of laboratories they are working on that also. Uh, this is the total ozone and some of the other studies that how much ozone is coming during the, my study period. Uh, so lastly, I want to conclude that uh, the, pig, uh, the plants growing at polar regions, they are getting higher amount of UV radiations, but the natural phenomena of their uh, survival over there is the development of UV absorbing pigments, thereby they are getting adaptations over there. So there is an adaptation of these plants by having UV absorbing pigments. So uh, thank you very much. Save environment, save humanity. Uh, my university is going to develop an advanced center for Antarctic environment studies. Right now I am having, uh, having the department of uh, environment and Institute of Earth Sciences. But now we are going to have a new advanced center for Antarctic and environment. Thank you very much.
You can always run away. <laughs> sí, ya. Diana, would you prefer to stand here? No. Walk around? Okay. I'll give you the handheld then. <clears throat> All right. So next up, we're going to have Deanna Wheeler. Okay. Good afternoon. This is, uh, remember this picture, this is our wetland. So, and I was a polar track teacher for two expeditions. And here I am on the expedition. It was 10 years ago, right now. I was on an icebreaker, and then three years later, I was on an icebreaker again in the Bering Sea and the Tukchin Sea. And with IPY, the whole um, knowledge to action, when I came back, we kind of did knowledge to action on steroids. So I'm going to uh, show you how we decided to act locally and think globally and connect everything through the polar regions through our watershed. And my passion is clean water and clean air, and now I had to connect it to the polars because that's also my passion. And here's a little bit of our school. We had the governor come out a couple years ago to visit our wetland. And since then, and a couple years ago, we received, because of our sustainability and all the actions we took, we got the Green Ribbon Award for the United States. We were named top 10 eco schools in the nation. And we got our picture in a book. And also, um, we are now our Ocean Guardian School. We are the only elementary school east of the Mississippi um, River to be a NOAA Ocean Guardian School. And one of my students, because of his efforts with our whole campaign to skip the straw, became a Presidential Environmental Youth Award. With the Skip the Straw, it started two years ago. Um, my students were very active. They went out in the community. They talked to the commissioners, which is our governing body. And through their efforts, a law was passed. And now our community will be skipping the straw and plastic stirs. And the commissioners came out to present them with the real um, the real law. And our students went and testified in the community uh, in front of the commissioners to tell why it was important. Okay, watershed. This is how we started. We, um, we were in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is near Washington, D.C., and we just exploit it. We go ahead and do maps. They taste it. They build it. They build models. Then we go out and look at the organisms in our uh, region, and we look at native ones. So one thing we do is do the whole citizen science with the monarchs. And then we build and we paint. And then we also use other organisms. We have a yellow perch, horseshoe crab, sturgeon, um, what do you call it, tadpoles, and our terrapins. These all are in my classroom. And over the years, we do this hatch, raise, and release programs. The terrapins are part of a bigger study from Ohio University. We decided because there was a little bit of erosion, we needed to think big and dream about what we could do to stop this erosion. This happened right after I came back. And we decided to incorporate 13 organizations. And we had three charrettes. And we had a landscape architect who did about, volunteered their time. And we gathered ideas from everywhere, everyone, and came up with some ideas. And we planted our wetland, like in the first time. We planted 4,000 plants in two days in 105 degree heat. I don't know what that is in Celsius. All right. And after about two months, this is what it looked like. And here we are the next fall out in the wetland doing outside real research and <laughs> connecting it to the polar regions because what we do here at a school affects the polar regions. And we did stop there. We had to do the front of the school. There's the front of the school, and there are some plans from our, our architect. And we decided to put a native arboretum and another outdoor classroom. 
And I love the person with the tutu out there. And then from our school, it goes from our wetland. We actually use Matthew Penson, another polar explorer, middle school. All the water goes to our wetland and then goes down to the Poe Monkey School Stream. We take the students there because that's the next stop in the watershed. And they go, they walk in the woods. A lot of them have never been in the woods. They collect macros. They do water testing. And that's the eight-year-olds. Then, and when they become nine in fourth grade, we go to the next place on the watershed, which is the Potomac River and Chapman State Park. Chapman is a person that lived in the 1800s, very sustainable, had great records. Um, he did a lot of um, records of all the fish, so we do a fish tally too and compare. And we also meet Mr. Chapman, a historical interpreter. Then we go a little bit further. The next one is Malice Bay, and that's where the sunken ships are. And we do art. We do lots of different activities. And then we go to the Chesapeake Bay. The kids put their feet in the water. Then we go, this is my um, best one, was last year we finally made it to the Atlantic Ocean, to the Delaware Bay, and the kids got to see the red knot, which is a bird that goes from Patagonia all the way up to the Arctic. And they got to see the interactions with the horseshoe crabs. We collect cats. We do murals. We did 43 feet of murals. And all out of caps. Lots of murals. And we make murals outside. The next two murals will connect it to the polar regions with the Arctic tundra swan, which is um, nests are actually winters in our area. And we also do art shed that says love our watershed. And we do community gardens, local, save on that gas and all the transport. We put gavions that collect the trash before it goes in our wetland. We also do plays, 45-minute plays. We do a model of the watershed, TNT. It's explosive. We also make an eight of 19-foot pilot whale with the 80 bags that it swallowed. So, and this year's um, theme is bags, reusable bags. We also do Polar Week, Polar Month, every December. Everyone does it. We have all different types of activities, research projects, art projects. We wrote 140 letters to our own polar uh, scientists, and they answered back. Thank you, Alan Pope, he answered one of them. And we have um, polar activities all month long. Our scientists, Lee Cooper, Jackie Grenmeyer, visit our school. And we have more activities. Notice the student put stop global warming. And then the middle school students use the PY um, activities and put them on for our um, students, which was very nice. I love taking aim at climate change because the people in there match our students. That's one thing that I need to do is always find researchers of people um, who are African American so our students can see that. And our students also did a recycled solar fountain. And this is a mural out of plastic bags and um, bubble wrap. And our, um, this is an augmented reality sandbox. Shows how to walk the watershed and how things go in the watershed. And the very last slide is our um, first school in our county to have a hydration station. And we save 51,000 one-time use bottles. So hopefully you got some ideas about what you can do to connect the watershed to the polar regions. Thank you. All right, then Anthony up next. She's coming down. Don't worry, if anyone was, any educators were like rapidly scribbling all those ideas down, just come talk to Deanna at some point before the end. Do you is it is it okay to just leave it in the within the PDF here, or do you want to like is there a full screen thing? The PDF you can do full screen. Aha! Yes, you can. Thank you. Excellent. Here's my hand. Will that um, actually advance? It does. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's cool. I didn't know that. And then do you want to walk around? Or? I'm a mobile. Okay. There you go. Yeah. I like it. Uh, so close. <laughs> Yeah, it's here. It's just not showing up. Why did we lose you? It shouldn't be. No matter, it's just a projector. Mm -hmm. No, I can't get anything. It's like FM Windows came. Hey. Room full of geniuses. Yes, yes. Make sure that clicker works. Ah, great. Great. Hi, my name is Anthony Specker. I teach philosophy, politics, and economics at Norwich School, which is about an hour and 20 minutes away from Cambridge by train. Prior to that, I was a civil servant in the Canadian Arctic. I lived in Nunavut for three years before coming to the UK and um, started to be a teacher. And I wanted to bring my love of the Arctic into schools, into my school and into other schools. And I settled as a way to do that to offer a model Arctic council. So you probably have heard of Model UN, where kids play the roles of diplomats and kind of cycle meetings with the United Nations. Well. Model Arctic Council does the same thing, except with the Arctic Council. So I run two of them, one in Norwich, that's Normac, one at a school in Spain, that's Mac Bilbao. And these are experiential learning events, again, in which people play the role as Arctic diplomats. I've run six of them so far over the past four years, involving over 200 pupils. These are residential conferences, three days long, um, so they're pretty intense events. And um, the interesting thing about it is what was interesting about the Arctic Council is that people don't only play the roles of diplomats from states, but they also play the roles of diplomats from indigenous people's groups. So they learn about the Arctic as a homeland, they learn about indigeneity, they learn about indigenous rights. Now I tried to make them like the Arctic Council. That is our SAO meeting, Senior Arctic Officials Meeting in Norwich on the left. That's the, one of the most recent ones, and it's finished chairmanship on the right. So we're trying to make them like real diplomatic meetings. And so that means that over the three days it is a pretty intense time. And the kids, when they're done with it, come away with a whole new group of friends who have gone through the same sort of intensive dynamic experience as they have. Now this is an exciting new format of model diplomacy for many kids, who, especially who have done model the UN. Um, what makes NORMAC and MAC Bilbao special a number of the things that I've listed, but I want to make two points. Um, one, again, is the, the opportunity to play non-governmental organizations and indigenous peoples to learn about the Arctic as a homeland. And second is that the Arctic Council takes all of its decisions by consensus. So the children have to face that challenge, um, not a grandstanding or lobbying or trying to get 50% plus one to agree with you to get your idea passed but rather they have to find the bridging solutions that bring people together so they can, because if, if not, if there is one person who does not agree, nothing passes. So they learn valuable skills in consensus building, negotiation, persuasion, um, which are possibly in our hyper-partisan political context at the moment, but these I think are valuable lessons for the kids to learn. But for some of them who've done lots of Model UN, it's just an antidote to Model UN fatigue. There's a bit, a bit tired. Model UN, so they want to do something different, which is great, and it's an opportunity, that wanting to do something different is an opportunity to get the polar regions in there. Now, Mac Bilbao and NORMAC, my two conferences, are the only model Arctic councils for secondary schools that are active in the world today. These are model Arctic councils, and since 2010, the Arctic Council is a young organization, it was founded in 1996. 
So monolarctic counts is quite a young thing. These are the ones that I've been able to find from 2010. And there were two secondary school ones in 2010, they were one-offs, and since then I've been running more, the only monolarctic councils for secondary schools. Um, which is uh, an, a, a fun thing to be reintroducing that back into secondary schools. It's not just for the university kids, for the whole reasons that you know. And, and over the past two years, so this is just two out of the four years that I've been running it, I've uh, we've been able to attract students from 27 different home countries. That doesn't mean schools from all these countries, because some of the schools would be international schools, Britain also being an international sort of place. Um, the kids themselves come from these countries, and they may be studying at schools in the UK or elsewhere. Um, but thus far, no, none of the kids who have participated have been from the Arctic. And very, very few of them have any Arctic experience whatsoever. So we really are introducing to them to the Arctic in many ways for the first time, which is exciting. Now, there's an educational purpose behind this. As we all know, the Arctic, uh, or the polar regions generally, I'm talking about the Arctic, of course, this is this old model Arctic Council. The Arctic is not part of the curriculum um, in Britain or in, in many places. Um, and what students get about the Arctic, if they get anything, is this media picture of the Arctic as either a pristine wilderness that has to be protected at all, at all costs, or it's um, a global treasure chest to be raided, and uh, over which the Arctic states are scrambling. So what I try to do is introduce them to a more nuanced picture of the Arctic, and especially with playing the roles of indigenous peoples and having to deal with indigenous issues, to um, introduce them to the idea of the Arctic as a homeland. So hopefully this is an educational corrective as well as an introduction. Um, and it's designed to make the Arctic um, and the Arctic Council accessible. Um, I assist with preparation. Um, there are mechanisms to help facilitate consensus, and we give them a lot of room to uh, be creative. It's, this is not a diplomatic scenario analysis. This is a creative learning. So they can pass resolutions that would be politically implausible in the, real, in the real world, and that's okay. Now, they seem to love it. We get very good testimonials. Um, but as we heard earlier in the panel, it's important to be able to measure the impact that you're having on students. So that's what I tried to do, and here we go. This is how students, this is how people thought that they learned. On the left, that's how they rated themselves out of five about their knowledge of the Arctic and indigenous peoples before the conference. On the right, that's how they rated themselves after the conference, out of five. They didn't become Arctic experts, but this suggests that they really felt like they learned a lot. And it suggests the certainty of their learning, the direction of their learning. And they agreed at high, high levels that they had learned a lot about the Arctic, about the Arctic Council, about Arctic issues and challenges, about indigenous peoples, less so about indigenous rights. I think that's a little bit more conceptual, and so it indicates an opportunity for some conceptual learning. But these are, as far as surveys go, extremely high levels of agreement about the learning that kids think they're taking away from this uh, program. Um, they also agreed that they were inspired to learn about the Arctic, although a little bit less so on the right. We have to remember, they're kids. They're inspired by lots of things. They might want to go and be many different things, and they wanted a taster of the Arctic. And if we put the seed of the Arctic in their minds and they go away, and they do something else, but then they remember it, that's still fine too. But over 90% said so they would want to do it again. They would want to do the Model Arctic Council again. And this is important to teachers. Three quarters of them agreed that they were more confident in public speaking, with negotiating, with reaching consensus than they were before they started the conference. Okay, so we've got some plans. I'm launching another one next year at another school. And what I'd really like to do is uh, partner with um, a high-profile organization to launch a model Arctic Council as an outreach and widening participation effort. effort with students from not tr schools that don't traditionally send people to university. And so um, working, hopefully, with some of those organizations there. Thank you very much. If you would be interested in participating in your school, or you know any schools that would like to be participate or help support, I would be very glad to hear from you. Thank you very much. There's also a video on the Web Snormac website, um, which I don't have time to show you. It's normac.org. So please go to normac.org. Oh
Um, you should just stay still. How can I stop the beeping in my heart? <laughs> oh, that's yeah, okay. That's okay. Just leave it. Okay. Oh, how am I going to close? Oh, oh before. Okay. Without breaking it, Barbara. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just put it in your pocket. That's it. No. Uh, but it's going to keep going. Right? Oh, yeah. See. Sí. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, perdón. Mejor. Hola, sí, soy de México. Ah, no te creo. <laughs> ¿Cuál es? ¿Con cuál avanza? Con este. Este yeah. 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 Hola. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, yo les voy a presentar un proyecto. You see how nervous I am? <laughs> 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 I'm going to present to you a project called Antarctic for the Brain. And this project is a mix between education, play, science, art, and technology. And all of this is focused in the care of the planet. I'm Paola Tello, I'm a physicist from Colombia. And in 2017, I was selected in a global initiative called Homeward Bound. Homeward Bound aimed to gather 1,000 women in a period of 10 years, and all these women are going to work around climate change and sustainability. Um, uh, part of this process um, associated with this experience, I create this educational program that is the one that I'm going to share with you. This is the photo of the second group, Homeward Bound uh, Gather Women every year, uh, about, average between 85 and 100 women. I'm in the corner of the photo, and that photo is important because I'm going to relate it later, later on. Um, this is me. As I mentioned, I have uh, two personalities during the day. I study rocks in the in geoscience, in the oil and gas industry. And during the evening, I work in an educational project that is driving all my passions and all my dreams. The key point here is that I'm going to ask you to use your Spanish. Antártida Prevalientes means Antarctic for the brave, but it has a special connotation, and I think it's one of the most powerful things in this project. Antarctic is a place, it's a place of peace, collaboration, and science. It's also very strong because it can be a symbol, and, and we know that it's very well uh, known to communicate climate action. But brave has something special. In Spanish, we have theaters for certain words. If we have explorers, we have Antarctic for exploradoras and for exploradores. You have the gender. But brave is the only few words that don't have gender. And I knew that my project would have a focus in the gender. What we do is three things. We communicate, we raise awareness, and we empower people. This was an initiative that born in my bike. I start cycle and, and I start to think, okay, I'm going to this expedition. It can be a really good experience to share how I'm going to do it. I need a project and I went to Colombia. I live here in England, I work here, and I went three times in Colombia and I managed to visit seven cities with an impact of 8,000 people in different schools. It was just crazy. And the thing that was crazy was that one day the children were running around very happy with the visit. And I wanted to get rid of them. And I said, you go to the classroom and you go to write a letter to the penguins. And you are going to tell me what you learned and how you are going to kill the planet. These children wrote more than 500 letters. But that's not the point. The point that was a journalist and the next day, I was in the news saying the women that is going to read letters to the penguins. And yes, I got a lot of coverage of the media, more than 100 news in Colombia, more than 20 international. And it also brings a lot of attention of the companies. I was able to get, gather the money for the expedition. I got 18 companies involved. Five of them paid the conference, paid the expedition. But most of them bring things for me or for the, for the children. We got donation for 1,000 books about environmental. And I don't know how, we won a prize. <laughs> uh, we got the second prize in, in initiatives that are innovative in the way that we teach. This is my niece, and this is my Xbox that is, is volunteering the project. Interesting, this, I said to the children, I would read their penguin letters with them to them, to the penguins. And then I was in Antarctica, I needed to read the penguin letters. But I was not alone. I was with a group of 80 fantastic women, and we decided to translate all the letters in English, one sentence for each letter, and we read the letters in all the languages that we have together, more than 50 languages. 
And it was really exciting because any children can feel the power of the words. And if you feel this is the power of the words, imagine what is the power of your actions. This is one of my best stories. Um, I got sponsored by a bank and they asked me to do a workshop. We organized this beautiful room with penguins in the background, these three meals for each. It was just fantastic. But the next day, I was going to one of the poorest areas in Colombia sponsored by them. I asked them the same, I asked them the same in the same conditions, and we found really interesting that I was gathering the letters because it was my memories. But one day, talking with a friend that is a, a doctor in London Metropolitan University, she said, I'm really interested in the letters, can I read them? And we started to classify my groups, and the children that were in the group that has more money because the parents work in the bank, they say, We are penguin, I'm going to visit you. And the children that got less money say, Pao, could you please bring uh, the photos of the penguins? And we started to see in the background, the social background of these children, they are showing us so much in the letters. And right now we are running a study of these letters. But we are running a study first in English. And thanks to polar educators, I were able to go to Dasher University uh, School. And I did the same with the children. We will publish uh, the first results of the penguin letters, and this is how we are measuring the impact of the project. What is key here is not me, is not that I wear white, is not that we have a display for this, it's the penguins. We, try, we communicate the message for love. We made the children fall in love, and I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to count three, and I'm going to show you something, and when I count three, you are going to do, ah. <laughs> One, two, and three. Oh. Okay. Activities like this, very <laughs> simple, melt people, and we make them to act in this way. But what is key is that we need that these children get home and get a nightmare for the parents. We want them to be a nightmare in their house. We create this passport, and in this passport, we ask them to write activities or things that they can improve, and we encourage them and they have different information here. We have a stamp, and we all love the stamps. In the past course, we want more stamps, and imagine the children. If you want a stamp at the end, I can give them a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> the logo was also a donation, but why Colombia mothers? And the key thing is about um, many things. Colombia is the second most biodiverse uh, country in the world. We are very fragile for climate change, and we have a lot of responsibility to care the planet. It's one minute left. Can somebody donate? <laughs> Two minutes. And it looks like the whales go to Colombia to, no, for sure, humpbacks. Whales go to Colombia to have the babies, to, I don't know, the breeding. And that's the impact. If we don't teach the people there that they need to care about the oceans, that, that's the relevance. And the way that we are doing is we are doing some activities that make them experience. I'm going to show you this whale. That's my favorite whale ever. And we put a lot of rubbish inside the whale. We connect the camera and we ask the children to tell us what is inside the whale. And that's fantastic. They get it. They get it in many ways. We have different activities. We show what is the relevance of Antarctica because it's a continent. And we have different um, activities that encourage them. Uh, there is four points that I think are the one that I want to share with you. This is really fun. We have so much fun in one and a half hours. And people say to me, thank you. And I just say, sorry, it's just my game. It's just I have so much fun. We are very consistent. And every time people is looking at us, then every time we bring our own stuff, like uh, if we want an ice cream, we show them that we have things. If we want a coffee, we show them that we are carrying these. We have all the time this, we have this pen, for example, you can change the, the inside of the pen. And I think it has an impact that if we are transmitting a message, we need to be consistent with, with that. Um, oh, the, I have to cut you off, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry, but it's okay. This is the project, start with me. Now we are a group of volunteers, we have a perspective of what is next, and I would like you to, to join me if you want to work together. Thank you. I have some famous stickers if you want to see them. Thank you. Sorry? I didn't have a blank. You're going to have a blank.
Oh, yeah, it's up to you. If you want to stand here, that's fine. And then it's just this one. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I need the hands. <laughs> if you want to use that, otherwise the arrow key. Pull that forward and reverse it. And one over here. Oh, I'm sorry. That first, and then whenever you're ready. Yeah, it's easy for men, isn't it? It's clip in my pocket. Pants, pants in general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi there. We might have to direct yourself to here, so if we can. That's actually just for the recording. That won't come across. Yes, very fancy. Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Watson, and I'm from the National STEM Learning Centre and Network. We provide um, training and development for teachers and technicians, as well as a variety of education and enrichment programs. Today, I'm going to speak to you about the Polar Explorer program. And some of you may have come along to our, one of our Polar Ambassadors workshops earlier on and got their, their hands mucky doing some of the activities. If you didn't, I'm going to give you a few details about the program. So, as I'm sure you'll know, um, 2016, the government invested £200 million in a new polar research vessel. And uh, those of you who are UK-based may recall the naming competition um, during which the UK public decided that we should call the new polar research vessel Boaty McBoatface. Uh, thankfully, that didn't happen. and um, The decision was made to call it the RRS Sir David Attenborough. But because of the public awareness that had been generated because of, through the naming competition, uh, they thought that actually we'll run an education program. Obviously, you know, young people are interested in this. And so the Polar Explorer, Explorer program was born. Now, interestingly, we go into schools and the young people have no idea what Boating at Boat Place is. But rather encouragingly, they do know who Sir David Attenborough is. So the funding came from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And we're working with them, with the Natural Environment Research Council, British Antarctic Survey, who I think you'll be meeting tomorrow, and others. The aim of the programme is to, um, we have some pretty good aims there, to increase the enjoyment, engagement in STEM lessons and extra extracurricular activities to increase the learning of science and scientific inquiry skills, to improve the quality of science teaching in schools, to raise awareness of the importance and relevance of science, the knowledge of career opportunities through studying STEM subjects, and of course, the knowledge of the work of the Polar Research Vessel. The programme covers all age groups, but particular focus is on, our, in the UK, well, in England, Key Stage 2, which is ages 7 to 11. The program has three main strands. The first one is a resource collection. We've curated 105 resources from a variety of um, education specialists, learned bodies, scientific organisations. We then have polar ambassadors who are trained um, members of our team who go into schools and offer dedicated support. And the third strand is to provide information for schools teachers, pupils, their families, and the general public. You may have seen the rather colourful um, starter box that's uh, just down there. Um, if not, do have a route through. But in that box is um, a variety of items that teachers and um, schools can use. The first one is the activity booklet. In the activity booklet are 18 activities uh, which you would have seen demonstrated by Claire if you were at the session. And they cover six themes and two age ranges, ages 7 to 11 and 11 to 19. The activities in the booklet are all aged at age 7 to 11. And these are taken into schools and teachers are given guidance on how they can run these activities in their classrooms. 
through our team of polar ambassadors. Our polar ambassadors are a broad mix of people. They are teachers, they're mathematicians, education consultants, um, the list is there, meteorologists, scientists, pilots, accountants, explorers and adventurers. The people who are interested in polar science, polar research and polar education. So they go into schools with this rather colourful box, which everyone's always very excited to open. Uh, there are stickers in there, which are always the most popular item. Also included in the box, as well as the activity booklet, are a range of items that schools can use to create a project area, classroom display. So there are postcards and booklets from British Antarctic Survey, some items to use with the activities and maps of Antarctica. I'll just give you some numbers. So the programme has been running for three years. We're in its third and final year now. We've worked with 600, directly worked with 660 schools. 500 of those have been supported by a polar ambassador and another 160 have been involved um, in grants work. So we also administered some grants to support transition between primary school and secondary school. Our polar ambassadors have delivered 65,000 teacher development hours. There are 68 polar ambassadors, 44 of which are still active with us in year three. And they've worked across those three years with 106,000 pupils. And then if you think those pupils then take home the information to their families. Our websites had over 59,000 web views. We've dis disseminated 650 of those lovely colourful boxes to schools. 105 resources, as I said. We've developed 18 new resources. And there's one education lead and one rather tired project officer. <laughs> we spoke earlier in, um, after one of the workshops in the panel session about how we measure impact. We capture impact in a number of ways and we try to do it in fun ways. So it's not got to be an onerous task or teachers and pupils don't want to do it. So we have action plans at the beginning of the programme and then at the end we collect impact surveys both from the teachers and from our polar ambassadors. The pupil attitudes survey, that's largely the information gathered by show of hands, pictures, smiley faces, data loggers. And then we have community groups where schools, um, teachers and polar ambassadors can add comments about what we're doing. I won't run through all these figures because there probably isn't time in, in eight minutes. But as you can see, the impact on teachers against the aims that we intended are really quite astounding. Um, and we didn't bribe them other than with the box. So we're in the high 90s of teachers saying that they've seen the impact they wanted to. The impact on pupils is great. And you see that there's quite a lot there about enjoyment and engagement because that's the first step, particularly at primary level. And then particularly interesting is um, the 87% increase, or sorry, stated an increase in pupils' STEM career aspirations. I'm going to whiz through now because I've only got a minute. So they are all the numbers. Here's the good bit. We've got some lovely pictures of the pupils enjoying themselves. Um, the bottom left picture there, we call that our Eureka moment picture. Pictures of the activities. One of the things that we ask the pupils to do is to draw what they think a polar explorer looks like. Mm -hmm. Now, some of those are fairly typical. You'd be interested to see that there are some girls in there, which we were really pleased to see. Uh, rather foolishly, I haven't included any of the pictures that they put at the end of the programme, but they were very different. They weren't all wrapped up in outdoor gear. There was much more awareness that there's scientists um, involved and that there's lab work and um, other types of jobs available. We connect through STEM ambassadors and STEM clubs. So it isn't just the activities in the classroom. In summary, I lose a point because I haven't got the fourth scene here. But we connect industry and academic professionals to schools. That's through our polar ambassadors and also through STEM ambassadors coming into the classroom and to STEM clubs to help um, deliver sessions. We collaborate with polar experts, research bodies and polar educators. We're communicating the breadth of opportunities available to young people as they consider their future. 
I'm going to win that point back now, I hope, because we, Lofty Claim, helped to create those scientists, techni technologists, engineers and mathematicians that will support polar research in the future. We certainly help create aspirations. Last words. Polar ambassador to one of the eight-year-old pupils he was working with. Yes, do you enjoy science? And the boy replied, I enjoy this science. And couldn't go without this. We got to meet David Attenborough, and there is David Attenborough pinning on one of our Polar Explorer badges. So if you haven't picked one up yet, then I suggest you do so. It's going to be the in thing in science next year. I'm not sure what they look like. I'm modeling one very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> do you want this one? Or do you want to stay here? Moving around or standing? Moving around. Let's do this. That's right. And then forward, backward. So, good evening, everyone. So, I'm going to explain this presentation in a small Lego man up here. <laughs> He's my mascot. It's, so, this presentation. I'm calling it Polar Curry because it is part of my current working project. And uh, curry is to do with curriculum, not to do with India. And uh, my name is Ram, the first three letters of the long scientific name up there. <laughs> so this particular talk is about connecting to people. A little background, uh, uh, I love travel. So the last 20 years, uh, and I've been in education. and. Uh, I've been to a school and a college in 92 countries so far, and I've worked with about 37 governments so far. And uh, so the last one was to create or map the Antarctic curriculum for Antarctica New Zealand. So I just came back from the ice to New Zealand in February, and to India to get a visa to the UK, and this is the first time I'm at an education conference at all. So thank you for having me here. So this particular talk is about communicating some scientific uh, tasks in Antarctica. And I'm using a mascot. In this case, it happens to be a Lego minifigure made out of plastic. Hopefully, they're moving to plant-based minifigures soon. Mm -hmm. So if any of you want content, photographs, which I normally give to educators, science researchers, so these are the places I've been to in the Arctic and the Antarctic. I've got photo books on each of these. and. Uh, I, I try and make it as educational as possible. So feel free to just ping me and ask for pictures or learning content or whatever else. And, uh, and So just to give a background, uh, I think as educators, the mistake we make is we create a lot of activities for extroverts, not necessarily for introverts. And uh, the second problem that uh, we needed to address was make sure that STEM at, at a higher level is fine, at a lower level it has to become STEAM or STEAM, if you want to include arts and reading and history and everything else. And uh, so two of the most popular games or activities were obviously Lego and uh, on the board game, card game front was Scrabble. So for me it was about how to gain attention of students in the classroom and help teachers do that while they are teaching. And the challenge was how much of instructional design do I use. A lot of researchers when they are trying to communicate don't often use as much instructional design and uh, for countries like India, and, and as Jose was talking about, places in Zambia where I've been, in the Congo, the biggest medium is football or food. So I taught the Icelandic lab 
to children in the Congo last year. And uh, but if you give them food or football up front, they won't come back into the classroom. Right? <laughs> so you need to do that last. So, but but the biggest thing is we are also talking about ratios of one is to sixty when it comes to faculty to students. So the sixty student goes missing, you won't know in the classroom. Uh, for for some of the countries, uh, like ratios of one is to ten, it's a lot more easier. So the first challenge is gaining attention, and uh, so the scabbard ties. Uh, going digital was one way. So this is about 30 seconds and uh, this could be communicated to a secondary student, you, you add layers to uh, university level students but the topic remains the same. But the challenge was how much data and information do you want to provide to the student but have a template so that if you want to communicate more you are able to do so. And uh, but the most important message was in this particular theme of seal surveys or the research activity was just one seal which returned from 2016 last year. So I don't know where the rest of them went. The second thing is the most serious topic. Quick snapshot to explain the scientific process in a short time, and there are layers of information that we add in between, depending on how you know how much communication that you want to put across. The other thing that we face as far as students or uh, even senior students go is there's a, there is a tendency towards go towards numbers or towards nature. So we try and make sure that uh, as much as possible give a balance of both. So it's, it's not just number crunching, it's also about art and design and biomimicry that we can bring it to the classroom. So explain it in the structure and the lot of girls who want to go after it. And, and that's, so this Lego man was on the shoulder of a friend of mine and uh, that's how small that, you know, that structure was. Uh, just to keep it short, Lego snow pit, measure the levels, measure mass, volume, you know the works. So if you want to communicate a difficult scientific process, I think a mascot that children are able to relate to is a very good medium. Sports is a very good medium. And uh, so, so if you're talking about numbers, so some of the programs, initially I was doing a lot of hands-on based workshops, but in India you, they say 10,000 students is a sampling error. So you're talking about 1 million, 2 million students that you need to communicate it to. So going digital is, is, is probably one of the ways. And uh, so the present project was uh, more about digital resources and uh, so a combination of you know, many figures seemed to be the best aspect. The other thing was making students relate to ordinary professions, not that researchers are you know exotic explorers, but the fact that there is a plumber, there is a tailor, there is a soldier, there is a sailor in war. So and you could connect them to sailors on a ship or New Zealand Air Force or US Air Force because I was in Christchurch at that point in time and even people who dress you up and, and the costumes that you wear. Eventually LEGO had to get into the polar regions and so did National Geographic so there are a lot of activity sheets available so if you want to pick them up or you can create your own I have a lot of them designed so just ask me and give me some and uh, yeah eventually students will you know pick up a lot of interesting things. So Zooniverse was one thing that I ran in some of the workshops, so a lot of open source projects. And eventually I started using some of the tools like an Agile MapMaker and the Google Earth Engine that you've heard about. And uh, for higher level classrooms, 
I mean, scaling up from a simple concept to wild concepts, some of these digital tools can work. Work. You up there, sorry. Yeah. So the last thing I think, as, as somebody else said about Polar Week, try and get an understanding of all the important dates that are there around and where you can, you know, force fit or try to fit in your Polar team, and that definitely works. Thank you very much. Yes, if you want to move around. <coughs> oh, she's coming. This one's going to go on you because it's for the recording. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And if you want to advance the slides. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. Just a few seconds to <clears throat> introduce myself. I come from Italy. My name is Rocco Monteduro. I studied environmental sciences <clears throat> at the Venice University. And I worked for uh, four years uh, for the Italian <coughs> National <coughs> Research Council, uh, focusing on chemical oceanography and working on board of the Italian research vessels <coughs> in uh, uh, both in Mediterranean Sea and in the Ross Sea in Antarctica. Uh, after these uh, amazing experiences, uh, I changed my work and now I work as a teacher. I teach in the little city of Treviso, which is about 20 kilometers away of Venice, in the northeast of our country. <coughs> the school I teach in is uh, uh, called the uh, high, high school Max Planck, it's a scientific school in which the students uh, have to attend many hours a, a, a week uh, of lessons about scientific subjects. And another remarkable thing to tell you about our school is the long-lasting collaboration that we have with the uh, Institute for the Dynamics of Environmental Processes, which is uh, situated in Venice, uh, whose staff is constantly engaged in uh, um, research projects uh, in Antarctica. They are basically they they are climatologists. So. Uh, all this led me to think that it would have been a good idea to give some our some of our students the opportunity to have an experience uh, at Svalbard Island, getting in touch with the Italian researchers uh, working at Venice, uh, <coughs> the University in Long Vienna, and focusing on uh, environmental issues. Uh, it was a difficult project to to plan and to perform. <coughs> uh, we did it. Lot of things. So most of my colleagues were skeptical about it. Anyway, uh, we involved immediately the, <clears throat> the institute uh, I just mentioned, and uh, they gave us uh, some scientific preparation to our pupils. And then we involved the uh, uh, Italian Alpine Club that took our uh, students to the mountains for a short time of uh, acclimatization, and then we made funds. Funds, funds, many funds. So we started uh, pretty successful uh, um, crowdfunding. Then we sold uh, homemade cookies in the squares and villages around Treviso on Sunday morning. <laughs> and then we had the chance to um, to meet some entrepreneurs, some local entrepreneurs, very sensitive to the, the, toward the, the, the um, <coughs> environment, environmental issues that helped us. Uh, Come uh, our true, our dream come true, and uh, but they asked us to run some conferences once come back home about the climate change. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, I suddenly realized that the main target of the project was not this one, okay, as I told you, but this one. Improving our territory, the scientific culture, and the awareness toward polar science and climate change. The fact is that 
Italy is a beautiful country, uh, good food, a lot of things to visit, uh, you know, but we have many problems to face and to solve as soon as possible. One of these problems is a gap to fill in terms of scientific culture, because, uh, because the common people don't know anything about uh, climate change, don't know anything about the uh, greenhouse perspective and so on. <coughs> so we start feeling on a mission, in a way. <coughs> Finally, the departure on July 2018, for 10 days we, um, we spent 10 days in Longer Bien <clears throat> and uh, we had the chance to meet Chiara Petroselli, who is a, a chemist working uh, for the um, University of Perugia. Uh, she's, she has been focusing on the presence in the atmosphere of black carbon, the tiny particles that sink and lay on the ice, accelerating the, the ice melting processes. So we were allowed to um, stand the, the, the sampling, okay, as you can see. And uh, so here we are, at, uh, our visit uh, uh, at uh, Eunice, and this is a um, little convivial time with the Italian researchers that uh, had knew that we had brought more than 100 kilograms of, of, of Italian food in Longer Bien. So they were <laughs> always. <laughs> okay. And uh, then we had time to visit uh, Svalbard too, to, some, to do some excursion. This is the uh, abandoned Rush, Russian coal mine of Pyramid. It's one of the strangest and creepiest places I've ever seen in my life. Maybe. And then we did some hiking with our students. And we local, with local guides that uh, uh, explain us something about the environmental spawn. was a really marvelous experience for everybody. Thank you. Okay. And this is the glaciers in front. Also, the journey to Svalbard, the contact with researchers and the course and participation conference about climate change, all these uh, made us better understand scientists' stance about climate change which is exactly that we have to communicate to population once come on. And so, here we are, our science communication efforts. We started uh, to run uh, our conferences, 45 events uh, from November to, uh, to May 2019. Uh, I'm the only one that uh, is uh, standing all 45, so quite a many task anyway. But uh, we have been realizing that uh, adults, above all adults, don't know anything about uh, all, uh, everything about what uh, is going on to the planet. <coughs> and this is our mission. In uh, I can close my speech telling you that our idea about the global action against climate change, which is something like a mosaic in which every single one of us has to put to set his own piece. That's exactly what I say to my students every day, not every day, every time I, I deal with a uh, climate change issue. Don't protest, don't, uh, uh, don't complain about politicians' behavior before doing your part, before setting your piece. That's the message I want to spread my students and to everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> very quick because we all want to go and have this lovely dinner. Um, as you know, I'm uh, in the executive committee of PI and I'm a president and I wanted to use the four C's 
that are the theme of this fourth international workshop, PEI, then I like to consider how these four actions, connecting, communicating, collaborating, and creating, can have different meanings. That was very bad timing. <laughs> no, for, for the batteries. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I think I love it. Yes, go ahead. I can't carry on anyway. The time is ticking. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's just reflect on what PI stands for. And in order to do so, I like to use. <laughs> <laughs> Novel experience. <laughs> <laughs> A lady. <laughs> Yeah, I want to use some, uh, some images that uh, Betty Trammell sent me about three years ago when I gave a, um, a lecture about PI at the summer school in San Sebastián in uh, Spain, in San Sebastián. Uh, from the first inception uh, at the LPI conference in Montreal to the official launch of um, PI at the AGU in 2013, Okay, San Francisco. Uh, I actually find this um, slide quite interesting because this is Betty. Yeah. This is work. Yes. And this, I just noticed that was me over there in 2013 in San Francisco. And uh, really, PEI has obviously filled a void in education. The team, which is uh, Polar Education, could not have been more timely at this particular time for mankind, that it's now become clear that the changes in the polar regions, and especially the Arctic, are affecting the Earth's climate all over the world. Even so, the success of PEI, for me, is somehow extraordinary. A network which exists only online, no visible headquarters, no official address, totally formal, resting on the enthusiasm, the dedication and the goodwill of a fairly small number of members, including the founders, nevertheless achieved a status which is objectively surprising. It is well respected, considered on a par with established academic outfits, which are the pillars of the polar world, such as CAR, IASC and ABEX. As the theme of polar education becomes more and more popular, uh, there are a number of entities which are entering the field of polar education, and we've had the chance to meet most of them during this meeting in Counter Edu, Wiki Polar Watch, Edu Arctic Polar Sports Program, International Polar Foundation as well. So I'm here really very quickly to share some thoughts about the future of PEI, and uh, we can definitely use our keywords, connect, we as PEI, we can establish connections with like-minded polar education initiatives and also with individual teachers in schools. We can communicate um, on a regular basis, exchanging, sharing information on uh, polar education. We can collaborate uh, with these institutions. We can expand our base and uh, carry on uh, with teachers and schools who wish to introduce polar education in their classroom. What we um, noticed throughout this meeting is how each individual nation has a different approach. And that's why Polar Education International is so open to every single need that each nation has. Uh, like in the United States, uh, you have many more hours, in Italy you have very little, and uh, it takes uh, time to adapt, but certainly we are there to uh, uh, give polar education a place in our school. Now, and create, so we can create, we can open, to create a wider circle of polar education initiative. And the polar book is a good example of the highest team in which we are served by the polar establishment. And it would be a very useful tool for teachers all over the world. And uh, I'd like to end these short considerations with a thought of admiration and thankfulness to these dedicated, committed, enthusiastic teachers who are still making PEI according to our mission statement 
a vibrant network promoting polar education and research for the global community. Thank you. Okay, before you fall asleep, um, I'll give a short talk about our research and how we do kid science in the cold. So we actually take the kids outside in cold regions. And uh, this is our group, and this is our group leader, Birgit Sattler. Some of you may know her, but she's not here today. Um, so um, our theme is the cryosphere and life. And when you think about cold regions, um, you associate it with um, extreme conditions and also with sterile um, landscapes, and that's the general uh, perception. However, we want to show that these are not sterile landscapes, it's actually full of life. And the major challenge is how do we communicate this paradoxon to kids and break it down, down on an easy level. So the next question, question we have is how do we actually put it uh, or where is the relevance for uh, learning about the cryosphere for kids? And actually for us it's quite easy. We live in the Alpine region so our home belongs to the cryosphere. And it's really important also for them to understand their adjacencies for several reasons. For example, there are natural hazards like avalanches, which affect all of us, and also in context with climate change and um, landslides and uh, permafrost falling. So it's a good reason to teach them about um, polar regions and the cryosphere in general. So the key messages we want to deliver to the kids are that the cryosphere is um, actually a cryobiosphere because there's a lot of life going on and it's far away from being a sterile desert and that there's more, much more to it than you see in this comic. So the diversity in the Antarctic is more than just penguins um, because the kings in the cryosphere are actually microbes. And it's really that ecosystem that is dom dominated by microbial life. We also want to show them that the definition of extreme conditions is a quite funny one, because when we think of extreme conditions, we think of low temperatures, low water availability, high radiation, and uh, low nutrient concentrations, and so on. However, these are all anthropocentric perspectives, and this little daily would have a completely different definition of extreme conditions, probably. So we also put uh, our knowledge transfer in a context with climate change, and also in, in the latest project we do with uh, the term bio-albedo, basically biota and microbes on the uh, snow and ice surface um, darken the surfaces and uh, hence contribute to increased melt rates. So how do we do this knowledge transfer? Uh, we have uh, kind of uh, three modules. The first one is, oh, okay, where do we do this first? Um, ideally on site in polar regions, as we have just heard from Rocco, um, because he went there in polar regions with students, which is quite cool. However, um, it's quite challenging to do that um, with a whole school class quite often, so we cannot afford it and do that. But we consider the Tyrolean Alps as our third pole, and we also see that changes that happen in the Arctic can be also seen in the Alpine regions, and therefore it's um, uh, good to do this, um, not in polar regions, but in our home environment. 
So the knowledge transfer happens uh, with in three modules, learn and prepare, field and lab, and talk and share. First, we teach them uh, basics about cold biology in the school classes. They, uh, ch ch children produce posters and get um, active and it's a hands-on activity. Then we actually take them to the glacier. So here, there are actually a bunch of kids standing on the glacier and they actually can see life on the glacier. Like here, this is, um, these are snow algae growing on snow surfaces and the samples when they melt, they are really red. It's also called blood snow. And they collect their own samples like we do. And then there are also more hands-on activities involved. They do uh, laboratory work. This is actually in a crevasse uh, on the glacier at 3,000 meters and also uh, in the laboratory. And these are the same tools and, and um, the same gear we also use for our science. And in the end, we the talk and share module consists of um, talking to the classes and um, explain the results and discuss results and at public events, uh, share our results with the community. Um, so we figured out um, that some things we can do with the kids and some are not so cool to do with kids. First, what works are hands-on activities. Um, here, for example, those kids uh, sample air. Um, it's also important to pass on responsibility and make them um, feel that uh, they contribute to uh, the scientific project and they have responsibility and also have them impact on uh, your research. Uh, for example, here they created a logo for an Antarctic expedition, and this is the current logo uh, for our project. And it's also important to give life a face, especially when it's small. And here you can see a tardigrade, they call them uh, Brits. And this is the tardigrade, you can pass it around. Yes. <laughs> and that's how, how, how they can grasp um, small things on glaciers. And it's also important to visualize other processes. This is our study site, and this happened last summer in uh, 90 days. And it's just an animation playing back and forth. And when the kids see this, they can really get the idea of climate change and uh, the whole story. So what does not work is uh, too little involvement. Um, kids get bored easily, things they cannot grasp, like DNA stuff, which we mainly do, but um, um, it's really difficult for them to understand it. Uh, big groups uh, should be avoided and experiments which are just done by adults are really boring for kids. So try to involve them. The platforms we use, um, Sparkling Science, which is a project where we link uh, the university and schools. So um, the kids come to the school and uh, we do research together. And this is uh, research which is uh, published later. Uh, there's the Young University, which is another project. Um, then the Digital Explorer, this is Jamie, you heard about him a lot these days. He actually went with us to Svalbard and uh, joined us. So on this website, uh, you will see uh, videos of us digging and coring um, in Svalbard. Uh, there's also Wings World Quest USA involved. And to sum up everything, to wrap it up, uh, the content we want to deliver is uh, there is active life, in the cryosphere, um, climate change can be observed also in alpine regions, and it's a good proxy for polar regions, and life uh, has an impact on the environment in the cryosphere. The models we use are learn and prepare, field and lab, talk and share, and there are multiple platforms we use um, to communicate our science with uh, not only kids, but also with the general um, uh, population. And with that, thank you very much and check out our uh, homepage. This is the current project we have, the Black Ice project. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end. Can we get one more big round of applause for all of our staff? Um, we are going to end with a five-minute free-for-all at the silent auction, but before we do that, uh, then we'll be heading to the, the Polar Banquet a little bit later this evening, um, but I just want to encourage everyone to continue the conversations that you've had over the last two days of the conference. Create was the last word for a reason in our uh, little slogan. It was colored differently on all the stuff for a reason. It's there for, as a call to action to you all, as a challenge to everybody to uh, go forth and create. Uh, yes? Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, also... The banquet is going to be in the banquet hall, but the buttery will be open. Um, so if you want to stop in there for a drink, I think the bar 
slides open, uh, cash bar on the way over there. And don't forget your evaluations. They're right on the same page as the program, and there's two dates, and that helps us assess our impacts. Dismissed. Unless you're getting stuff. <laughs> yeah, and now's your chance to win things. Yeah. Left to make your suitcase heavier. Yeah. <laughs>